America's desire to be one nation under God has quickly become coming, instead of being the United States, the divided states. And everywhere you look, division is occurring on the macro level. Presidential candidates talk about uniting the nation while they fight. We all are aware of the ongoing racial divide in our nation, the division between police and citizens, the divisions within our own homes and families. And the divisions keep growing no matter what the efforts are to seek to heal them. Jesus Christ prayed a prayer, the longest recorded prayer in the Bible that he prayed, found in St. John chapter 17. And in that prayer, he's going to give you and me a secret. He's going to tell us something that will be life transforming in light of all the divides that we're facing today, all the schisms and the fissures that are separating us. In Jesus' discourse, he is about to be arrested. They're getting ready to come and arrest him within 24 hours and begin the process of taking him to the cross. On this day before his arrest, he gathers his disciples together and gives them final words before his departure, knowing what was to come. And as he concluded his time with them, knowing that the moment of his arrest and crucifixion was, was nigh, he prayed for them. Chapter 17 of John is that prayer. But he says, I'm not only praying for you, I'm praying for all of those who will come after you who believe on me because of your word. So in other words, the prayer wasn't just for them, it was for all Christians. So Jesus' prayer is for you and me and tucked in that prayer is a secret. I call it a secret because I don't think we've fully gotten the impact of what Jesus shares with them and with us. Because the secret he, go, he is going to disclose in his prayer to his father about his disciples is about the power of unity. Please notice with me just some of the references. For example, in verse 11, it says at the end of the verse that they may be one even as we are. In verse 21, he begins it by saying that they may all be one. In verse 22, he ends it by saying that they may be one just as we are one. In the beginning of verse 23, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity. So as you can see, Jesus Christ is torridly concerned in his prayer for his father that his followers emulate the oneness that he possesses with his own father. And you'll see why as we go along, because if you get this secret, I call it, it really could be life transforming. Since he's concerned about unity and oneness, let's clarify what it means. Because everybody doesn't define this word the same way, but Jesus makes it clear what he means. He says, I want them to be one like you and I are one. So whatever the unity is he wants us to have, it was to be a replica of the unity he himself possesses with his own father. What did this unity mean? Look at verse 4. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. 
Unity has to do with oneness of purpose. I completed the work you have left me here to do. Unity is not sameness, where everybody's the same. It is distinctiveness going in the same direction in order to achieve a common purpose. Unity is purpose-driven, not persons-driven. When the cowboys line up, there are different positions by different people with different backgrounds, but there's only one goal line. So all of these differences that exist of positions, of persons, they're all pointed toward that one direction to that one goal line for their differences are designed to achieve a purpose. But it's designed to accomplish a goal. So unity is purposeful. Unity is not sameness because the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. They are three distinct persons. But they operate on the same page because they're going after the same purpose. I've defined the unity like a pretzel. The first hole is not the second hole. The second hole is not the third hole, but they're all tied together by the same dough. Apart from sin, it's okay for folk to be different than you. God doesn't expect men to be like women or women to be like men. I don't care what the culture says. They are different by design. God doesn't expect everybody to have the same personality, be the same race, have the same interests. Apart from sin, differences are absolutely critical, absolutely essential, and eternally determined. So when you try to change folk apart from sin, you being more God in their life than God is. God created the differences, whether it's gender or race or culture. All of those are intended. People are not supposed to be the same. I'm sure in your family, one of the conflicts that regularly happens is folk trying to change you and you trying to change them. If it's related to sin, you got a right. If it's not related to sin, you're just different. But the issue of unity is not in the changing of the person, it is in the clarifying of the purpose. So if you can ever clarify that purpose and get all the persons to achieve the legitimate purpose, then you will have unity of function while still having distinction of personalities. Because Jesus says, the unity that we have is to filter down to them. When you see an orchestra before it's time for them to perform and they're warming up their instruments, there's discord. You can't make sense of what they're playing because everybody's doing their own thing. But then the conductor walks out and he takes the stick and he hits it a few times, calling their attention to him. And when he calls the attention and holds up, holds up the baton and stretches it out, and their focus is on him, all of a sudden these independent discords are harmonized. And now you're getting a song, one song played by multiple instruments following the leader to achieve the same contribution of what is being played, the same score. Because now instead of like before doing their own thing, they're now playing a common song. What is missing in unity, whether it's personal unity, family unity, church unity, and most certainly in societal union, is the common purpose. So when everybody starts creating their own different purposes and start moving toward their own different purposes, there will automatically be conflict because we, we've chosen different goal lines. We're headed toward a different place. 
And instead of fighting over our differences, apart from sin, we should be fighting for that goal line. Jesus says, our unity is tied to the fact that I have completed the work that you've called me to do. Now, in order to achieve this unity, there had to be submission to legitimate authority. I came to do the work you sent me here to do. So even though the father is equal to the son, they had an arrangement where the son would submit to the will of the father in order to accomplish the goal of the kingdom. And so it involves submission to legitimate authority as long as there's clarity of the goal. So what unity can't do is it cannot exist if there is no clarity of what we're unified about. In other words, if it's unclear where you're going, you will get there every time. Okay? You'll get there every time because nobody knows where this thing is headed. So it's unity of purpose. Now watch this, stay with me. This will take us somewhere. In this unity of purpose, in this unity of purpose, there is a key element in order for the unity of purpose to occur. Notice what Jesus says in verse 17 and 19. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Verse 19, for their sake I sanctified myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. His goal is that there might be oneness. The road to oneness is sanctification in the truth. Let me put it another way. If there is no truth, there can be no legitimate unity. If there, let me say it again, if there is no truth, you cannot arrive at legitimate unity because God only responds to the truth. Which means you got to know what the truth is. We live in a world today of probabilities, of potentialities, of preferences. We live in a world today where everybody's got an idea about everything. And we base our decisions on our own ideologies and ideas. And so you hear people talk about my truth and you talk about your truth. And so when you got everybody with their own truth, you got everybody with their own direction. And when you got everybody with their own direction, you don't have unity. And when you don't have unity, you don't have God. Stay with me here. Remember the biblical definition of truth. It is an absolute standard by which reality is measured. Truth lives outside of you. Let me say that again. Truth lives outside of you. We call it objective truth. It's true whether you like it or not, want it or not, accept it or not, believe it or not, buy it or not. If it's true, it's truth. We live in a world today where people operate on what they believe to be true. Because you believe it doesn't make it true. It just means it's, you believe it. Because unless it sits outside of you, coming from an objective standard, then you could be believing a lie thinking it's true. And if you believe a lie thinking it's true, and you operate on your belief that's not the truth, it means you're operating on a lie and will be led by a lie into falsehood thinking it was the truth during the trip. And a lot of us are living our lives on a lie and wonder why things are not working out because we believed it to be true. Truth is an objective standard by which reality is measured. And he says, I want you to be sanctified with the truth. Sanctified means to be set apart for a purpose. Jesus says, I was sanctified. I sanctify myself, verse 19. I set myself apart 
based on the word to the truth to fulfill the purpose that God has for me. God, he now says, sanctify them the same way that I'm sanctifying me. By the truth. Okay, what would you say to an unsure pilot who says, I think this is the button I ought to push to get this plane off the ground. I think, I think, I, I'm not sure, but I, 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 I my, this is my best guess. I don't know about you, but I'm changing planes because I don't want a pilot guessing with my life on the flight. Okay, suppose you had a doctor who said, well, I think this is the place I ought to cut. Uh, I, uh, and if it's not, don't worry, I'll cut till I find it. Uh, uh, I think you're going to change doctors because you want some certainty if they're going to be splitting you open. Or let's say you go to a pharmacist and the pharmacist says, well, there's a lot of medicine in here and um, I think this will help you. I, I'll, I'll, uh, there's a lot I could choose from, but let me just choose something. And he comes up with his best guess about your medicine. You, you're going to go to another pharmacy. You're going to talk to another pharmacist because when your life is at stake, you don't want folk guessing with your life. God doesn't want you guessing with your life. Truth takes the guesswork out of life because you're operating on an absolute standard that sits outside of you. Jesus made a powerful statement in John 8. Remember verse 31, 32, right in there. He says, uh, uh, and we all quote it, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Hmm. Let, let's, let's talk about that for a moment because it's about truth. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. There's a whole bunch in there. Number one, he says truth exists. You shall know it. Secondly, he says the truth that exists, you got to know it before it can free you. So just because it's there doesn't mean you have it. Truth already exists but you shall know it. So if you don't know the truth, you can't be freed by it. Which means if you've been duped by a lie, you will continually be a slave because you won't be free. He says the truth, once you know it, and he goes on to say and abide in it, will liberate you. Well, what does that mean? If you're not liberated, either you don't know the truth or you're not operating with the truth because he says the truth that you know will liberate you. So you know why a lot of us are in bondage? Because we're living on a lie believing it's the truth. Because he says the truth that you know will liberate you. So if you're being held hostage illegitimately, the truth had not penetrated yet. Either because you don't know what it is or you're not operating by it, so you're being held hostage to something you should have been liberated from years ago. Because truth has liberating power. Let me put it in everyday language. Truth is God's view on any subject matter. And if you want to just, just be raw with it, truth is God's view on any subject matter. Or as the scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. So if you disagree with God, guess what God just called you? He's called you a liar. If your mama disagrees with God, guess what God played the dozens with on your mama? Your mama is a liar. If your partners disagree with God, guess what God just said about your posse? They're liars. If the government disagrees with God, guess what God said? You're a liar. Doesn't matter how many people believe it. Doesn't matter how many people vote for it. Doesn't matter how many people feel it. Doesn't matter how many people think about it. Once it disagrees with God, personally, as a family, as a church, or in society, God calling all of them liars. And if you are a liar, <laughs> You're not operating on the truth. And if you're not operating on the truth, you can't be set free. And you can't be set free because you can't be unified. Let, let, let me tell you something else about, let me tell you something else about the truth. 
the truth is bigger than the facts. Okay? You can have the facts and still not know the truth. Oh. See, you, the data may be 100% correct and you still not know the truth. Uh, let's say I got a headache. I got a splitting headache. My head is killing me. My head is killing me. I'm just hurting so bad. So because my head is killing me, I want, I, I want, I'm, I'm going to go up to, I'm going to go up to Walgreens and I'm going to get me some Tylenol PM because, because my head is hurting so bad and I, I just can't function with this headache. So I, I make my way up and I go get my Tylenol PM and I start popping pills because I got a fact. The fact is my head hurts. I know if my head hurts and I know if it's a fact that my head hurts. So because my head is hurting and I know that my, it's a fact that my head is hurting, I'm going to address it. I go to Walgreens, I get my Tylenol extra strength and, and, and I, I get it, I start taking it. Oh, but what do you know? My head's still hurting. My head's still hurting. The Tylenol didn't solve my problem. I call the doctor the next day. He says, come in. I tell him my problem. I've tried everything. And then he does a scan of my brain and discovers I have a tumor. Oh, I had the fact. My head was hurting. But because I didn't know the truth, I went to Walgreens. If I would have known the truth, I would have gone to the doctor first. Because if I would have known it was a tumor, I wouldn't go to Walgreens. I went to Walgreens because I was operating on a fact without knowing the truth. A lot of folk operate on the fact. And the fact is factual if it's a real fact. But that does not mean it's the truth because the truth is the root that is responsible for the facts. So you can have the facts, but with knowledge of the truth. We got, that's why the Bible says folk are ever learning and never coming into the knowledge of the truth. Many of you and us with education. See, because that, that's the problem. That, that is the one problem with school. School is absolutely critical. School is on some level is absolutely necessary. But the problem with school is they can teach you the facts and not get around to the truth. That's why the Bible says the knowledge of God is the foundation of wisdom. The fear of God is the foundation of knowledge and wisdom. Why? Because if you start with God, you start with the truth so you know how to interpret the facts. In fact, you find out then whether it is a fact. So it's God's view of a matter. It's like the uh, Bill Clem. Bill Clem was a big husky umpire before there was integration in baseball, and it was the ninth inning, and uh, the, the, the team was one score down, and they were one score down, and, and, uh, and they had a runner on third base, and so they hit a ground ball, and the run from third base was coming in to tie the game. He threw it to the catcher. The guy slid. The catcher put the, the mitt down to tag him, and dust flew everywhere because uh, it, was, it was real dusty and dust flew everywhere you could hardly see. One team came out and said, he's safe, he's safe. The other team came out and said, he's out, he's out, safe, out, safe, out, safe, out. Bill Clem took off his, his, his mask, his umpire mask, and threw it down and said, everybody shut up. He said, because it ain't nothing till I call it. All y'all doing is making a lot of noise because it means nothing until I say what it is. We got Republicans hollering over here and Democrats hollering over here, blacks hollering over here, whites hollering over here. We got policemen hollering over here, citizens hollering over here, and God is saying, shut up! It ain't nothing till I call it. Because when you start with the truth, you save time. You save fights. You save arguments because you're starting with the root and not discussing the fruit. So, uh, the, uh, the, the guy was in the, in, the, in the ship and the ship was going down and he, it was foggy out and he saw a light coming at him and he was an admiral. He said, he sent the message, go five miles south, we're going to collide. The captain of the, 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 the voice came back and said, no, you go five miles north. He said, no, I said, go five miles south. We're on a collision course. The voice came back, no, you go five miles south. He said, I'm an admiral in the United States Navy, and I said, go five miles north, five, five degrees north. The voice came back, absolutely not. You go five degrees south, 
I'm the lighthouse. God's not negotiating his truth just because we want to change the direction. If it's foggy in your life, you better agree with what he says and not what you think, feel, and the like. So his goal is unity, but God only operates with truth that you know. If in fact you want to see him manifest himself to you. Now, watch this. He gives a warning because he knows that this unity can be interrupted. And so he says, verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Okay, stay with me here. He knows that there is a system at work to keep you from the truth. And that system is called the world. The world is defined as that system headed by Satan that leaves God out. It is that system orchestrated by the devil, stay with me here, that wants to get God meaningfully out of the conversation without getting rid of God's name. Satan doesn't mind God's name as long as it's not God's truth. So he's a, he's a, he's, he's a fan of religion. Keep God's name, use them for invocations, benedictions, go to church, all that stuff, but don't let his truth be the determiner. You remember Adam and Eve? God gave them a word. Watch this now. The last verse of chapter two says, man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Oh, one, that's the word one, unity. They're gonna be unified. They're gonna live happily ever after. The next verse. Chapter 3, verse 1, after the last verse of chapter 2, Slick shows up in the garden. The devil slithers his way in and says, hath God said? The first conversation between a human being and the devil was about God. Hath God said? And so he twisted the word of God so that the oneness that was agreed upon a verse earlier destroys the garden, the whole home, destroys the relationship, destroys the kids, wind up destroying the whole world because the truth got co-opted by the devil. Because the devil has a kingdom because he knows, he knows something, he knows something, let me tell you what he knows. He knows if he can keep you from the truth, he can break up the unity. And if he can break up the unity, he'll keep God away. Because God cannot operate in disunity. That's why Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18 says, Mark them out who cause disunity in the church, and if necessary, remove them. Illegitimate disunity. Because some things are legitimate disunity, but illegitimate disunity. He says folk who go around gossiping and creating mess and creating factions in the church, point them out and deal with them because you will lose God if you keep them. See, it's a, it's a, whole, it's a whole deal here because what he is saying to you and me is that unity Disunity comes because of the absence of God and the absence of God will always be with the loss of truth because God can't function in a lie. The Bible says the devil is a liar and then it says he's the father of lies. Now you know what a father is, it's folk that got children. So he a born liar and he got offsprings. Okay. And some of you know what that's like because you looked at your family members and said, you ain't nothing but a liar. So Satan is after removing it. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kingdom issue because in Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 to 29, 
Jesus says, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. What? He says, the Satan cast out Satan and Satan can't be strong. He goes on and he says, it's a city divided against itself. And watch this, and a home divided against itself, he says. So if I was the devil and I wanted to keep God out of your home, your church, and your country, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create illegitimate disunity. I'm going to create disunity because I want to disrupt the kingdom. And a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So here's what you need to know. A lot of that stuff you're fighting about, you remember Conrad Dobler and the beer commercial a number of years ago? He was in the football stand and he'd go around to one group and he'd say, tastes great. And he'd go over here and say, let's fill it. Tastes great. Let's fill it. Now he get the folks shouting at each other. Tastes great. Let's fill it. Tastes great. Let's fill it. Now the folk fighting. And he laughing, walking off. Because he done started mess. That's what the devil does. Have you ever wondered if, if you're married, you have a good friend, how did we wind up wanting a divorce because of how you cooked? You, how we wind up in a fist fight? How we wind up you throwing my clothes out? When we were just talking about, you know, which TV show we like. How did we get there? Because once the devil got an opportunity on a little thing, he fed that thing, he fed that thing, he fed that thing, and one thing became another thing, and another thing became another thing, until you wind up not even knowing how this argument got started. Because that's what he's after. He's after getting God out, because 1 Peter 3, 7 says, when you and your mate are out of sync, tell the husband don't pray, God won't listen. So in order to keep God out of your house, he keeps you in conflict so there is no unity, so God doesn't feel comfortable, so the devil can sow seeds and make a little thing a huge thing. Let me tell you how good the devil is at disunity. He can create you disunifying with yourself. Have you ever been in conflict with you? You know, you, 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 you. You, 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 you in conflict with you. You don't know which you you talking to. And if you don't know which you you talking to, you know you're going to confuse everybody else. I mean, here, here, you know, so, so you split between, I, mean, I should do that, but am I going to do this? And I'm like, no, should I do that? You know, he gets you fighting with you because he can draw us from the truth. And so, and so, this world system, you know, I, I got a problem, I got a problem. You, you have this problem too, many of you. On my lawn, because I got ants wanting to set up their own kingdom. <laughs> See? Ant hill, and these are not normal ants, these are fire ants. Okay? And they will let you know if you, you've touched their premises. Okay? You ever been stung by a fire ant, a bunch of fire ants? They will light you up. Because okay? you, you know why they're building that kingdom? Because they're serving their queen. See, right down in that fire, they got a queen. And that queen has called her workers to serve her kingdom. And when that queen calls her workers to serve their kingdom, they build up a castle in your kingdom called your lawn. They want to they wanna disrupt your lawn. And they, they keep growing and they're growing and the mound gets bigger and bigger because they want to disrupt the beauty of your lawn with their kingdom. Satan wants to build his kingdom in your life, in your home, in the church, and in the culture. And he builds it and he gathers his, his folk there in a lot. So I have very little sympathy for the mound. I want to get rid of the mound. I want to get rid of the mound because it will continue to grow if I don't. It will continue to expand. So Satan wants to build a kingdom so that his kingdom expands so that, let me, let me tell you how big this unity thing is. Genesis 11, 1 to 9, Tower of Babel. It says, all the world spoke with one voice. They were unified. They came up with one plan to build a civilization with one religion. They build a ziggurat, that's a tower, and they said, this tower is going to take us all the way to heaven, humanism. We're going to get to heaven by man. 
okay? We don't need God. We just need men to come together and sing kubaya <laughs> and, you know, hold hands and all that. And we're going to just build a civilization. And then it says, and God came down. So here's a great lesson right there. No matter how high you get, God still got to come down because you ain't going but so high without it. Okay? So, so, so don't, think, don't think any of us, me, you, us, uh, is, we all that. Because no matter what, what degrees you have, what title you have, what money you have, what car you drive, what home you live in, God still got to come down. You ain't, you ain't but so much. Okay? So he comes down to see what the sons of men have built. And when God sees that they want to build a civilization without him, he says, let, he said, let us, because he's talking to the Trinity. He says, let us divide this thing. We're going to split this thing up. And he says, the reason we're going to divide it is if we let them stay unified, there's nothing that they will not be able to pull off on earth because of the power of unity. So in order to keep them on earth from thinking more of themselves than they ought to think, we're going to mess this thing up. We're going to confuse their languages so that they won't know what each other's talking about. You know, and it was interesting, they used the technology of the day to build a civilization. They got all this stuff going on. You know, we got, we got real technology today. And look, look at the evil this technology is producing in the midst of all of its benefits. And there's a, there's a technology of the day, and God said, oh, we're we going we to deal with that technology. Okay, we're going we to we hack it. We're going to hack that technology. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go right in there, split up the system, and nobody can talk to nobody, and they were confused because God will not let unity last that leaves him out. Okay. You leave God out, and you won't be unified, but for so long, something going to happen. Because to try to have legitimate unity that's not based on God and his truth, he will not allow he rejects unity apart from him. But now the good news. Remember, unity is oneness of purpose. It is establishing a common goal that's legitimate, that the differences are pointing to, that invites God into its midst. Oh, and then something spectacular will occur. He says... In verse 23, I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity, get better at it, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Mm. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. He says, when you have legitimate unity as defined biblically, the world will see something it has not seen. The world will see you love them like you loved me. That's a powerful statement. To love is to compassionately and righteously seek the well-being of another. He says, if you will be perfected in unity, God will manifest his commitment to you. Let me say that again. Where there is unity, you get to see God show up. You get to see God invade your circumstances. You get to see God invade your situation. You get to see God flip things, twist things, change things. Whether it's invading it emotionally or invading it circumstantially, you get to see God loving you. See, a lot of us are operating on other folk testimony about how real God is and powerful God is and strong God is. We, we, we depend on what God said to our neighbor because he never talks to us. But he says, if you will operate based on the truth in unity, you will show the world that you love them like you show that you love me. But he says, if you are unified based on the truth, then you will see me. And he uses another word. I love this word in verse uh, 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Ooh, not glory. Glory is where God shows off. Glory is where the invisible God becomes visible. Glory is where 
He enters into your situations and lets you see his attributes at work. Glory is where God paints his name on a billboard so you can see that it was God. God glory is where God just wants to show off. He wants to let you see he's God. That's why he tells a couple that's in conflict, you pray, I'm not listening. But in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, he says, but if you come together in unity, he says to a couple, he says, if you're married, the same way that you're physically intimate, he says, if you become spiritually intimate, I'll show you my power. There was, there was a couple of them, and they were in conflict. They had a rebellious son. He was uh, on drugs and all of this, and it was causing disruption in the home, and they had to put him out and all of this. Every Wednesday, they came together for fasting and prayer. Every Wednesday, they came together, they fasted, gave up the food, and spent that 30 minutes, 45 minutes in fasting and prayer, either by phone or in person. They, they came together in unity and fasted in prayer. Six months later, they got a call from their son. God had brought some other people in, their li in his life that challenged him, uh, brought him back to the Lord, got him off of drugs, and he called, Mama, can I come back home? I'm clean. And right now, he's working with his parents in the ministry. And they credit it to the unity that they had. Spiritually. Spiritually. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to pray with your mate sometime or to pray with your kids or to pray with people in your life, how it keeps getting interrupted or it's uncomfortable or, or something else goes wrong? You, you just think that's personality or your emotions. No, that's Satan wanting to keep you being disunified so God doesn't have to show up. That's what that is. Or in the church, or in the church. He wants to keep us from contact with God so that God doesn't feel comfortable showing up where we are. It, that's why Jesus' prayer is so big on unity, that the glory of God may be revealed. Psalm 133, verses 1 to 3. It says, the baby agrees with me. Psalm 133, 1 to 3 says how God loves the unity of his people. He says God loves and wants the unity of his people. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then he comes to verse 3 and he says for it is out of that unity he will command a blessing. Now watch that. That's the only place in the Bible that I'm aware of that God talks about commanding a blessing. You know what a command is? You better do it. That's what a command is. A command means there, there, you, you don't have an option here, uh, not a legitimate option. So God tells blessings when to come and when to stop. He says, when I see unity, I tell a blessing what to do. And the blessing has got to obey me. I tell heaven what to send down to earth, and when I tell heaven to do something, heaven does it. Earth is where I have my problem. But up in heaven, I command the blessing, and the blessing has no choice but to fly down where you are because you're operating in unity. So a lot of that stuff we're fighting about, all that is is the devil sowing seeds so he can keep God away so that he doesn't have to command a thing in our life and in our circumstance. And so, there's power in unity. I remember the, the Peanuts cartoon with Lucy. Lucy went and changed the channel. And the response came back, you can't, you can't change the channel just because you want to change the channel. Lucy said, yeah, I can. And I said, why, why you think you got the power? Why you think you got the power to change this channel? She said, you see these five fingers? Right now, they're separated, but when they get unified, <laughs> I can change this channel. Linus looked at his fingers and said, why can't y'all get together like that? Because when there is legitimate unity under the authority of God, there's power, and he commands a blessing. That's why the Bible says, preserve, Ephesians 4, the unity of the spirit in the belt, bond, the belt of peace. Preserve it. You fight for that unity. You don't let the devil have his way in your life, in your family, because once he gets a lie in there and expand it, you got chaos.